We're going to complete our study of WKB today. Uh, there's a lot of important things we haven't said yet. And in particular, we have not explained how it all works, really, in the sense of the connection formulas. That's the most non-trivial part of the WKB story. And in some ways, it's uh, some of the most interesting things that you, you have to learn from this. It's an opportunity to learn something about differential equation, Fourier transforms, and the limits of the quantities you can really compute. So we will begin our discussion with some uh, reconsideration of these airy functions uh, you've started to hear about, probably some in the homework, some in recitation. So this uh, relates to this person, uh, George Biddle Airy from the Airy functions, uh, who lived in, uh, in England for 90 years. Uh, he was the seventh royal astronomer, and he was an astronomer from 1835 to 1881. Uh, was located, his uh, work area, in uh, Greenwich. It's a little bit outside of London. Um, and that's where astronomers were working hard to establish all the data associated with the prime meridian. Uh, France also tried to make uh, their own meridian, the most important one, but at the end of the day, it all depended on which astronomers did the most work uh, in measuring a precise, accurate determination of times, motion of the moon, Jupiter satellites, all kinds of things that were pretty important at that time, especially also in the manufacturing of good telescopes and good clocks. So um, Mr. Airy also worked in optics, and that's where he discovered these functions we're studying. And they're very relevant to uh, the WKB approximation. So let me remind you a little of what you've been considering in the homework and extend some of those ideas as well. So. You considered a differential equation, d second psi, du squared equal u psi. A pretty innocent looking differential equation. I'm always surprised how a differential equation that looks so simple can be so intricate. But anyway, it is, and that's the Airy equation, and uh, it shows up for this problem that you have, a, for example, an infinite wall and a potential that goes up like that. The bound states are controlled by solutions of this equation at the end of the day. This is after you clean up all the units and do all the work. But it shows in other places as well. And uh, you probably found already that uh, this psi function, psi of u, is given as a constant times an integral that came from Fourier transformations of e to the i k cube over 3 e to the i k u. And, uh, so this is our integral. This is our um, solution of this equation. And the nice thing is that this integral tells you a lot about the function. It's a perfectly nice definition of the function. You may have noticed, and I think it was discussed to some degree in recitation as well, that uh, the Fourier transform converts 
this equation into a first order differential equation because this becomes p squared times psi. Well, you know from Schrodinger equations, uh, this part of the differential equation comes from p squared. On the other hand, multiplication by x is the same as ddp in Fourier space. Therefore, you get a ddp of psi equal p squared psi equation, and that uh, equation is a first-order differential equation. First-order differential equations have one solution. So you would say, okay, I tried to do this by Fourier transform, and I'm getting just half of the solutions, and that's true. The reason is that the other f uh, solution of this differential equation doesn't quite have a Fourier transform, so it's a little more difficult to get at. But um, once you think of this uh, integral, it is kind of useful to try to be a little more general and think of it in terms of the complex plane, the complex k plane. So here is the k plane. And this integral is over k from minus infinity to infinity. So this is the standard contour of integration. We can call it the contour C1. When you're doing this integral, and you're doing this in the complex plane, you may want to consider that if you go off the real line, maybe things are even better. In particular, as you're integrating, u is a fixed number, it's a fixed coordinate. We usually think of u as real, but we could think of u as complex as well. And uh, this integral has this factor, it's an oscillatory factor that becomes faster and faster oscillating in time. Uh, but the magnitude of the integrand is one at every place. It oscillates very fast, but the magnitude is one. Not the best situation possible. You know, it, when you're doing an integral, you have the, the feeling that eventually you get zero because it's oscillating so fast, but it would be nicer if you had a decay. So for that, consider that this function would decay if k, if the imaginary part of k cubed is positive, decay. Why? If the imaginary part of k cube is positive, you have a k cube would be i times a positive number. i times i is minus 1, so you get a suppression factor if the imaginary part of k cube is positive. So if you're integrating over a region where the imaginary part of k cube is positive, you will be in good shape. Now, if you think of k as a complex number e to the i theta k, k cube would be this. and the imaginary part of k cube is positive, k cube is positive, requires that this angle 3i theta k be between pi and 0. Why? Because if you have a complex number, any complex number, it's imaginary part is positive if the argument of that angle goes between 0 and pi. Moreover, uh, 
if you get an imaginary part positive for some angle theta k, if m of k cube is positive for some theta k, it is also positive for theta k plus 2 pi over 3. Because if you add 2 pi over 3 to theta k, you change this by 2 pi, and therefore the exponential doesn't change. From this inequality, I'm sorry, I have an i too many here. The imaginary part of this requires that the argument of this be between 0 and pi, or theta k between pi over 3 and 0. So actually here, I should draw 0 to pi over 3. Uh, this is at 60 degrees. And that's the region in K space where the integral is suppressed. Now, we also said that this uh, region is unchanged if you add 2 pi over 3. So um, if I add 2 pi over 3, that's precisely uh, one third of a turn. This, uh, this is 30 degrees. It goes this area into this. And finally, if I add again 2 pi over 3, it goes into 30, 30, 30, and to this region. I guess it's a sign of nuclear material, hazardous materials, or something like that. It's not hazardous to our health. We'll, <laughs> we'll survive this lecture. Uh, so what's happening here actually is uh, something quite interesting. Um, for example, you're doing this integral here. If you started doing this integral, once you're far, far away, you start going up. The integral over here is going to give nothing because you're very far away, and therefore you're in the region of absolute exponential suppression. We said this thing is, has a positive imaginary part, and therefore you have a suppression. It's k cubed. So it's becoming like e to the minus radius cube is killed. So it's no problem to go up here and you get nothing. So what it means is that actually there's no singularities in the integrand either. This integral that we've done here could have been done over this contour like that, and then you could have gone like that. You can do it in mathematics. The answer will be the same. Or you could have gone like that. Or you could have gone here like this. Also, you're suppressed over here. And you're suppressed over here. And actually, by counter deformation, you could, instead of doing this interval, you could have gone here and gone up like that and done that. That also would have been the same result. Uh, there's nothing, the integrand is analytic here, so this, you can push it down and nothing goes wrong. Or you could have done even this integral, like that. Because the integral here is zero and the integral here is zero, so you can bring it down. In fact, if you did this, I think with Mathematica, Mathematica, when you try to do this integral, kind of does it, but it complains a little. It's worried that you know, it's not getting the answer right because it's still the integrand is still big. It's oscillating very fast, but it's big. 
If you go here, I think Mathematica will complain less and will give you the same answer. So this is the power of complex analysis that allows you to do this integral in all kinds of ways. And, uh, and there's something more, even more important about this that I will explain in the notes, but uh, I can convey the idea here. When you prove that this is a solution, and when you went to Fourier space, you had to do an integration by parts. And an integration by parts is always dangerous. And if you're trying to find a real, a true solution of your problem, you have to make sure it works. P, the operator P, is supposed to be um, her mission. And here, what happens is that you turn this into DDP, and you have to fall back this factor. And here is where this discussion is very relevant. Because when you fold out this factor, you have to integrate. You can get contributions from the boundary. And you have to make sure those contributions are zero. Otherwise, you're not solving the differential equation, really. And the happy thing about these contours, and now that you understand these regions, is that Yes, the boundary contributions are going to be zero from the two sides because of this suppression factor. So this analysis actually uh, turns it into a rigorous analysis. And the, the part that uh, has to do with the boundary conditions, the, the fact that the operations that you're doing are legal when you try to solve the differential equation require, this is the details that uh, I will not, not derive now, require precisely that e to the i k cube over 3, e to the i k u, vanish at the ends of the counter gamma that you're using to solve the problem. So if you're into it from here to here, it should vanish at this end and at that end. Rigorously speaking, this thing only vanishes if you're a little bit up. Um, but uh, this is what you really need for the equation to be a solution. <clears throat> 